for me, when it comes to houseplants, the alocasia seems to be the one that has gotten away in past years of plant parenthood. It's the plant that I've always been so fascinated by, so obsessed with, so fixated on when I'm pinning and on Instagram searching for houseplants to add to my collection. But when I took them home, I never could quite figure out how to care for them and how to have them thrive in my extremely dry homes in upstate New York. But plant friends, after many years of trial and error, after so much research, (laughs) I think I have cracked the codes on these specimen plants. And I am so excited to share everything I have learned about how to care for alocasia successfully with you today and introduce you to some of my new favorite alocasia varieties that I've been successfully growing in my home. So welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives by doing so. I'm Maria, former plant killer turned happy plant lady, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, your new best plant friend. On Growing Joy with Plants, you'll find conversations about houseplant care, gardening tutorials, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy. Hello, plant friends. Welcome back to the Growing Joy with Plants podcast. I am Maria. If you are returning as a returning listener, welcome back. I'm so excited to give you this deep dive on the genus Alocasia today. Thanks for returning to the show and, and making me a part of your plant journey. It's my ultimate honor. And if you're new here, hi, I'm Maria. I'm the host of the show. I'm here to help you care for plants successfully and grow more joy in your life. Today, we are diving deep in partnership with Proven Winners Leaf Joy into the genus of Alocasia. To me, it's one of the most fascinating genus of plants out there. I feel like when you look at these plants, you see jungle vibes. A lot of collectors see these plants in the plant shops, in the garden centers, and they yearn to take them home. I will argue that it's not that they're hard to care for. It's that they have very high standards of care. So it's not that you can't care for them. You can care for them very successfully, but you have to have the environment that they're going to thrive in. And through lots of trial and error, through lots of dead allocation in my past, but thriving ones now, I'm really excited to share with you guys what I've learned in hopes to set you up for success. The other thing that I love about alocasia is I am convinced that alocasia look like aliens. I don't know if it's like the shape of the leaves that they have, how the veins kind of look like I don't know, bones, like facial bones, or if it's that they have these large oval face-shaped leaves on very skinny stems. But to me, whenever I look at alocasia, I look at aliens. <laughs> like I'm just like, oh, hi. Hi, you alien alocasia. How you doing? And for some reason that tickles me because to an extent, I've said this a lot before, but houseplants in general are kind of like little aliens that we have to take care for. Like they can't communicate with us. They're like these little green potted alien friends that we have to learn how to communicate with, learn how to care for. And I just, I don't know. I think the alocasia really represent that. Please let me know on social media if you agree with me or if you think I'm completely crazy. If you haven't heard of alocasia before, you might know them as the shield plants. You might know them as elephant ears. Those are some other common terms, but alocasia is a genus of plants, many of them having these large leaves and thin stems. And so today we're going to dive into both everything that I've learned about alocasia care, you know, what you need to do to have them thriving. We're going to go over some troubleshooting tips, and then we're going to dive into some species that I've been caring for lately and absolutely loving. And this is part of the Growing Joy with Leaf Joy series where we're diving deep on genuses to break down everything you need to know to care successfully for all plants at the end of this series, right? So thanks again to our partner, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. So let's dive into alocasia care. So first off, when I think about care for any type of plant, whether it's alocasia, whether it's ficus, whether it's, you know, maranta, whether it's monstera, you want to think about where the plants hang out in nature, right? In real life. Because really, as houseplant parents, what we're trying to do is replicate their outdoor environment to the best of our abilities indoor. Now, are we setting ourselves up for success? Now, some might argue that you're kind of setting yourself up for failure because a lot of our homes aren't indoor, aren't tropical rainforests. But okay, so let's dive into alocasia care. 
Now, before we dive into water, humidity, soil, all of that kind of stuff, I like to zoom out and think about alocasia and houseplants in general and where they live in nature, right? Like where do they grow naturally? And alocasia specifically grow and thrive in the tropical rainforest. So you can find them in the tropical rainforest of Southeast Asia, New Guinea, parts of Australia, or the Pacific Islands. And these plants are understory plants. So they're growing at the bottom of these tropical rainforests. So if you've been lucky enough to visit rainforests before, or if you've even just seen pictures of them on the internet, if you look at the bottom of the rainforest, what are you going to think? Okay, it's going to get dappled light because the majority of the light is going to be at the top of the canopy. The light that the alocasia at the bottom of the rainforest are going to get dappled light, the light that trickles through the, the trees and the leaves at the top of the canopy. It's going to be very humid, and there's going to be relatively even moisture at the bottom of the rainforest because there's the soil and the, you know, moss and all of the good stuff at the bottom of the rainforest to kind of retain moisture. Now let's take that and look at our homes, right? So I'm in upstate New York. (laughs) I'm lucky if I have 20% humidity in my house, where in the rainforest, you're probably getting 80 to 90% humidity. The light that I have is coming through windows, which is actually, you know, dappled. It can be relatively similar. But, you know, my house in upstate New York that's dry and has, you know, forced heat and air conditioning is definitely not not as similar to the jungle. However, there are tricks and tips that I can give you to kind of recreate that experience for your plants to help them thrive. So why don't we dive in? Let's talk about light first, because light is the most important thing for plants. Plants eat light. Plants make their food through photosynthesis and light is an integral part of photosynthesis. So I think starting off with light is super important. So if we go back to the rainforest, we're remembering you're getting dappled light. So alocasia don't like lots of direct sunlight, right? They don't want to be basking in the sunlight like a cacti might. Because they're getting that dappled light, often the understory jungle plants are getting like 2 to 15% of the amount of light that is available to the upper canopy, right? Because the, the light is filtering through the leaves. And interestingly enough, when you look at an alocasia leaf, it is thought that the large leaf on this tiny stem, but the the real estate of the leaf, it's so, it's such a large leaf because it's trying to capture as much dappled light as possible on the bottom of the jungle. And also a lot of alocasia have absolutely mesmerizing backs of their leaves. You also see this in the Marantaceae family. They'll have purple undersides. And it's thought that that purple underside is actually an adaptation to help them kind of capture um, and make the most of the, the limited light at the bottom of the jungle understory, which I think is kind of fascinating. And also I'm totally obsessed with the look of that like flash of purple in a houseplant collection of all green. So alocasia are going to like bright indirect light. You might see alocasia as being marketed as low light plants, but I don't like saying any plant is a low light plant because really if a plant is a quote unquote low light plant, it's really low light tolerant. And in my opinion, most of us overestimate the amount of light available to our plants in our home. And so let's just go with the medium light, right? Like bright, indirect light. Now, alocasia are great for plant collections. If you have a lot of highlight plants, I have a lot of highlight plants that take all of the real estate right up front and center against my big windows. But alocasia, you can afford to kind of put them in that bright and direct light. So often I put my alocasia on the coffee table that's a couple of feet away from my window when I have these big Western facing windows. I can put them under a grow light. I can put them under, you know, anywhere that gets kind of gentle, indirect sunlight, either in a window or a foot or two away from a window, because that will also naturally have less light. But I think it's nice that they're not going to compete with your fiddle leaf figs and your ficus and your succulents, right? Like they're not going to take up that that precious real estate that that all of our houseplants fight over. If you have a northern facing window or maybe an eastern facing window, you could also probably put most alocasia in there. Light is very independent to whatever your window exposure is what the trees are outside of your window exposure. You know, light is very independent of every person's own environment. So it's hard to give just kind of like a blanket suggestion for windows or like where exactly in your home you should put alocasia, but you're going to want to give them bright indirect light. So they're able to get that photosynthesis. A big troubleshooting thing that I'll see is if people have alocasia that like only have three leaves, and if it grows another leaf, it will kill off 
a, a leaf. So like it'll grow a leaf and then it'll lose a leaf. So it'll always stay at this like three leaf maximum. That's usually that that plant isn't getting enough light. So if it's not getting enough light and it can't sustain itself with enough food from that light, it'll naturally kind of keep itself in homeostasis. So if you have plants that are dropping leaves and they're not in like a huge sunny location, I would suggest always trying to give them a little bit more light and seeing how they respond to that. And in general, I really am always going to say, you know, you probably, your plants might need a little bit more light than you think they do because humans perceive light very differently than plants do. And if you need more of a light crap, you know, tutorial, we have tons of episodes in the podcast on how does light work, how to use grow lights, how to understand natural light. We have a free download on how to understand the natural light in your home. There's tons of supportive resources in the show notes here. But since we're focusing on alocasia, we are going to move on to soil moisture. So first off, when we talk about soil moisture, I want to talk about one thing that you're going to notice in the soil if you ever repot an alocasia. Alocasia have tuber-like roots. So don't be scared if you're repotting an alocasia and you see these like little almost like little mini potatoes on the roots. They're like these tuber-like roots. That's totally normal. Don't cut them off. Don't be scared. Let them be that those tuber like roots kind of store water for the alocasia. So anyway, alocasia, if we're going back to the rainforest, you know, we're thinking pretty evenly moist soil. You can let the top inch of your soil dry out, but alocasia do not want to be dried out. When you see an alocasia get totally dried out, that's when you're going to see the plant totally go limp. And, you know, that little stem holding up the big leaf, you don't want the plant to struggle with that. So I like to keep my alocasia in pretty evenly moist soil. I try my best to not let them dry out. When I have my problems, that's when I've let them dry out too much. And, you know, I'll let that first knuckle, you know, you stick your finger in the soil, that first knuckle's worth, you can let kind of get a little bit dry. And then that's when it's time to water again. And your soil and your alocasia are going to dry out. You know, if we had the same alocasia cuprea and I had it in my house and you had it in your house, it's probably going to dry out a little bit differently. So when you bring plants home, especially if this is your first time trying with alocasia, there might be a little bit of a learning curve, but just know, you know, you're doing great. Be mindful of the soil. And also when you're checking soil moisture, I highly recommend turning it into a mindful moment, right? You know, in my book, Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, which is all about how to live a happier life with plants, I say, you know, there's two different ways that you can measure soil moisture. You can jam your finger into the soil, pull it out, just kind of be mindful on your phone, like just seeing, you know, if the soil is moist or not, or you can turn it into a mindful moment. You can take a deep breath. You can gently put your finger in the soil. You can rub the soil between your two fingers. And in that moment, think, how many of my senses can I engage? Can I sift, can I sniff the soil? Can I feel it in between my two fingers? I wouldn't recommend tasting it. Let's let's leave that sense out. What color is it, right? Because moist soil is going to look darker brown than dry soil, which would be lighter. You can also feel what's the temperature, right? Moist soil is, tends to be a little cooler to touch than dry soil, which could be warmer. And just have that moment of like true, true, true presence with your plant. If you struggle with moisture, you can also play around with a moisture meter. I have a whole episode on my YouTube channel on moisture meters and hygrometers, two things that would be amazing for the alocasia plant parent. But a moisture meter is essentially a probe that you can stick into the soil and it will tell you how wet the soil is. So if you have a big pot or, you know, if you're like really just new and and kind of worried about this, you can get a moisture meter and play around with that. I have multiple moisture meters. I use them all the time when I was a beginning plant parent. I don't really use them anymore because I have a good sense of my plants now. But as you're getting to know your plants, they're super fun to have. And you know, when you get one, you're going to run around to your whole collection, like putting them in every single pot, like a real nerd. (laughs) Because alocasia like moist soil, I also am pretty choosy with what pots I put them in. So I like to put my alocasia in plastic or glazed pots or even a self-watering planter. Because if you put them in terracotta, the terracotta is going to wick that soil moisture out. And I want to kind of keep that moisture because most of my plants are more low maintenance plants that I'm watering like once every couple of weeks. They're in terracotta. But in order to kind of compensate for that, I'm going to put my alocasia in pots that are going to help them dry out slower. A lot of people I know put their alocasia in self-watering planters as well. Self-watering planters don't really work for me because I forget about them because they're not on the same watering routine. But if you have self-watering, watering planters, I've heard, you know, a lot of people have great success with them with their more moisture loving genus. And last but not least, another way to like kind of cultivate a relationship with your plant and understanding when it needs to be watered is once you once you get a sense for the watering routine of your plant, when the plant is 
freshly watered, pick the pot up. And then right before you water the plant, pick the pot up. So you'll understand the difference in weight between a, you know, freshly watered pot of soil and a totally dry pot of soil. That's also super helpful. Okay, now let's talk about humidity. Humidity, I think, is probably the most important aspect of caring for alocasia. For me, this was the biggest error that I made in my previous years of trying so hard to care for alocasia and failing miserably. Alocasia like humidity. No ands or ifs about it, right, plant friends? In the rainforest, you know, they're dealing with 80 to 90% humidity, and then they come into our homes. My home is very dry. My hygrometer today says my home is like 20% humidity. So humidity is going to be the thing that helps you have thriving alocasia. You'll see alocasia leaves start to kind of crisp at the edges. Uh, you'll see them start to curl. Those are general signs that you need, you need some more humidity. So when it comes to increasing humidity successfully, and I've tried a lot of different techniques, the only thing that has really worked to increase humidity for an extended period of time is a humidifier, a humidifier that is running on a daily basis in your home. So I can't humidify my entire home. I have a friend who has a humidifying system for her entire home. It keeps her home between, you know, 50 and 70% humidity, clicks on, clicks off. I don't have that. I'm a renter. I have one room in my house, my office, where I keep all of my high moisture plants, my alocasias, my calatheas, my ferns, and I have my humidifier there. Um, I run it during the day and I'll let it run through the night until it kind of runs out and then I'll refill it. That's really the only way that I've found to like really make a difference in my very dry home. You might be lucky and you live in the Pacific Northwest and it's 50% humidity anyway. If you're one of those people, plant friends, I'm so jealous of you. I'm so jealous of you. Congratulations. If you want to dive into this genus, I would highly recommend getting a humidifier. I have a humidifier that you can put uh, essential oils in. So I put thieves oil in it all winter and it makes my house smell so good. So I think humidifiers, they're great for your plants and they're also great for our skin, like our human body and our skin. We're not supposed to be in these dry situations. Leslie Halleck and I are coming out with an episode on humidity if you want to dive deeper on, into hu humidity, but it's really good for us. And in that episode, I shared that, you know, I really doubled down on humidifiers once I got my baby bird, Frankie, because in the winter, he started scratching his little claws because they were so dry. And so that's when I was like, okay, fine. I'm a bird. I'm a crazy bird mom. I will do a humidifier. I'm fine gasping for, you know, for dry air, but not my bird. So anyway, we happily have my humidifier running in my office now <laughs> with all my allocation. Another great trick is growing under glass. So if you have like one alocasia specimen, or maybe you have like an Ikea grow shelf, or you have, you know, some sort of Edwardian case, or you have glass cloches, I have a big glass vase that has a top, you can put one alocasia in like a big glass vase, um, that is going to make a microclimate under the glass that will be super humid and comfortable for your plants. You can also group a bunch of plants together. So I renovated one of my closets in my office to turn into a little house plant haven. I like put a grow light in there. There's 16 plants in this one area. And if I put my hygrometer in that closet, it's noticeably more humid than even just the rest of my office. So you can group plants together. Um, in my opinion, pebble trays and spritzing plants is not going to be the thing that gets your alocasia happy. You know, you, you do need to take humidity a little bit more serious with this genus of plants, but you will be so rewarded because these plants are so freaking incredible and they're so worth it. Your respiratory system will also be very happy. In terms of fertilizer, my general rule with all house plants is when you see growth, fertilize. Support your plant where it, when it's growing. A lot of my plants are under grow lights, right? So they're not really experiencing the dormancy outside. You know, if you Google, you know, when to fertilize your plants and a blog, a plant care blog comes up, a lot of these blogs are going to tell you to fertilize in the spring and summer in the quote unquote growing season. But I have plants that are under grow lights all year round, right? So they're not really getting that sense of seasons that other plants that are just in my windows would. So those plants are going to put off new leaves in the winter. And if I see new leaves, I will continue fertilizing those plants. That's just my personal practice. If you want to go by the like only fertilizing in the spring and summer, live your truth, live your best life. But I'm here to encourage you to fertilize your plants when they need support, when they need, you know, nutritional support, when they're growing more gorgeous leaves for you. With dormancy, a lot of people say like, watch out, your alocasia are going to go fully dormant. I don't really see this with the alocasia that I have in terms of full dormancy, like they lose all their leaves. Like I don't experience that with my houseplants. I don't think I have a lot of friends that experience that. Um, there are houseplants that do experience extreme dormancy, but 
it's not really alocasia. So they might experience a quiescence, which is like a quieting. So because there's shorter days, because there's less light availability, they might have to kind of do some internal pruning and actually drop a few leaves. So in the winter, you might see leaf drop from your alocasia, but I wouldn't be really worried if it was only a couple of leaves and it was in the winter. It's not your plant going fully dormant. It's just your plant kind of preparing for this rest period in the winter when there's less light availability. It's not going to be able to make as much food for itself. It just kind of like gets a little quiet before it'll start growing again when there's more light availability. If you also don't want to experience that, you can put your alocasia under grow lights like I do. Another thing I love to recommend is if your plant is experiencing some quiescence, if your plant is is having some leaf drops and getting a little cozy, I would say use that as an opportunity to experience quiescence for yourself, right? Like what aspect of your life needs to be a little quiet? Do you need to hibernate a little bit? Do you need to slow down in one aspect of in an aspect of your life? I see plant life parallels in every plant that I have. I wrote a whole book on this topic. I really believe that plants can be incredible self-growth teachers and helpers and mirrors for us. So, you know, if your plants are taking a bit of a break, maybe you need to as well in some aspect of your life. So let's talk about alocasia troubleshooting. I already talked about the whole like, my alocasia can't grow more than three leaves. You know, you see that sometimes. Oftentimes with alocasia, I would say it's probably a lighting issue or it's probably a humidity issue, right? So if your plant is having trouble sustaining lots of bush, bushy growth, I would experiment giving it a little bit more light. Also, it might be a watering thing. You know, the turgidity, the watering gives the stems the turgidity to hold the leaf up. So you might have to kind of tinker with your watering schedule. And it's okay that it's going to take you a while. As I've brought all of these alocasia into my home, particularly my alocasia dragon scale, like he and I are are getting to know each other. And he's I've overwatered him once. He's had some leaves go yellow and drop off. I've removed them. We're learning. He's showing me what I need to know in order to, you know, in order in order to keep growing. So if you see yellow leaves, that's probably a sign of if the leaves are getting fully yellow, that's probably a sign that you overwatered. And it's okay. As long as not all the leaves are yellow, you can just cut those yellow leaves off and just peel back your watering and just kind of find the right rhythm with that plant. Alocasia leaves are really big. And so I also suggest wiping them down like once a quarter. You don't want them to collect dust. It could it could prevent transpiration and photosynthesis. So make sure that your leaves are nice and clean. And so many alocasia have those glossy like leaf cuticles that are so sexy and so, you know, so gorgeous. So you want to make sure that they get that shine. You can wipe your plants down just with water and a cloth, or some people do use neem oil. If you do have an alocasia that's going south and you think humidity is an issue, you can always try the houseplant hospital. I talked about this for the first time with Mark Hatchadorian in an episode a long time ago, but I I have a whole YouTube video on how I resuscitated a Sinanth with this houseplant hospital kind of technique. But basically, you put the plant, if a plant is going south, you basically put it in a plastic bag, you give it an extra boost of humidity and allow it to nurse itself back to health. You can do this under glass, or you can do it with a plastic bag. I think in the YouTube video, I did like a straight up plastic bag. And I've brought this Sananth back to life so many times. It hates me so much, but I won't let it, I won't let it die on me. But anyway, we'll put that in there in case you ever need a houseplant hospital trick for yourself. If your leaves are drooping, like I said, you know, it's probably an overwatering or an underwatering situation because the turgidity is so, so important for your stem. So be mindful of that. A lot of people will say that alocasia are vectors for spider mites. And I totally hear you. I totally believe this. I totally believe that a lot of people, a lot of people's alocasia get spider mites. We have a whole episode on houseplant pests that you can go and listen to how to treat for spider mites. But I also want to encourage you that I'm curious, are alocasia vectors for spider mites or are alocasia harder to get to thrive in your home and plants that are unhappy are vectors for spider mites? Plant pests tend to descend on unhappy plants. So I'm going to argue that if you can have healthy, happy alocasia in your home because you water them correctly, you've got great humidity going. I don't know if spider mites are going to be an issue. I'm very curious about that kind of myth about alocasia and spider mites. And it it makes sense because they are harder to care for successfully. But, you know, just going to push back on that a little bit. Because <laughs> why not? Now I want to go into jewel alocasia versus non-jewel alocasia and go into a little bit of an overview of multiple species of alocasia that I've been loving so far. Before we do that, I want to thank our episode partner and sponsor, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. 
They are the alocasia rulers. Oh my gosh. I recently just came back from visiting the Proven Winners Leaf Joy greenhouses in Virginia. Inside these fancy modern European greenhouses, it's like if, if they're like fe- football fields of alocasia. It was wild. Proven Winners Leaf Joy are really setting a new standard for houseplant cultivation. They are such plant nerds. They're selecting the best plant genetics. They're cultivating them. They're growing them in this amazing state-of-the-art greenhouse. And they're cultivating such interesting varieties of houseplants. I'm about to dive into some of them, plant friends, because they sent me all of these alocasia. But, oh my God, I've never seen some of these before. I've had so much fun getting to know these species. And if you're just kind of like looking to spice up your collection, Proven Winners Leaf Joy is definitely going to have a plant for you. If you have a wish list, I'm going to bet money that Proven Winners Leaf Joy is growing your wishlist plants already. And they're either coming to market or they're already in the market. Another thing I love about them is that they have plant tags that have real Latin scientific names and plant care on them, right? They partnered with me exclusively on this episode to create a high quality educational episode on alocasia because they really want to empower the consumer. They want to empower the people getting their plants to really understand how to successfully care for the plants that they're lovingly cultivating. And if you struggle with picking plants, they have different lines of plants based on good fits. So like they have a high humidity loving plant, high humidity plant line. They have a small space line. They have a bright light line, right? So they have, they make it really easy to pick the right plants for yourself. So next time you're at your favorite garden center, look for the proven winners leaf joy name tag. Let your draw drop on the floor (laughs) with all of the different varieties when you see the Proven Winners display in your local garden center. And let me know on social media what plant you end up bringing home. It's been so fun seeing you guys tag me with your Proven Winners Leaf Joy new scores that you get at the garden center. So keep doing that. I can't wait. I'm like celebrating with you. Find plant joy and leaf joy. Dare I say grow joy with leaf joy. If you want to know where your local leaf joy dealer is, you can go to provenwinners.com to find where you can get a leaf joy plant near you. All right, so let's break down a couple of alocasia that I've been getting to know very well. So first off, this was a fun thing I learned. Jewel alocasia, you've seen this this word a lot, jewel alocasia. Jewel alocasia just means small alocasia, like they would fit in a jewel box. So there are super big alocasia, like the big elephant ears that people put outdoors in landscaping. And then there are jewel alocasia and a lot of houseplant alocasia are jewel, our little jewel box alocasia. I just think that's very sweet. So let's begin. Alocasia ninja, otherwise known as Alocasia reginula ninja. This plant is a very, it's weird for me to call plants sexy, but I'm like, this is a sexy plant. It's almost black. Its leaves are almost black and super fuzzy. It's a jewel alocasia. It's got this deep green black leaves, fuzzy black leaves and white stripes. It is so striking. It looks alien-esque, right? It's from subtropical Asia and Eastern Australia, and it is so cool. So I love the Alocasia Ninja. I think, so the Alocasia Cuprea is one of my dream plants, and I recently got it when I went to go visit the Proven Winners Greenhouse, and I couldn't believe it. I've, I've pined over this plant. I've pinned it on Instagram. I've pinned it on, on Pinterest so many times. This was my wishless plant, and I'm so happy to have it. It's growing so beautifully in my home. It's putting off new leaves. Each leaf gets bigger and bigger. This plant can grow so big. But the thing that is so cool about the Alocasia cuprea, cuprea means copper in Latin. So these leaves are so big and they have this coppery sheen to them, which is so gorgeous. They have deep purple backsides. So when you look at like a green collection of houseplants, it's so fun to see the flash of purple. And um, some people I've, I've heard say they think that it looks like the plant has abs because it has very deep ridges, like the veins make these very deep ridges. But The leaf itself is so dark, almost brown, almost bronzy. It's just such a gorgeous plant. I love it so much. So that's called the Alocasia cuprea or the Alocasia red secret. So cuprea has been my wishlist plant forever, but then it's definitely getting a run for its money with the Alocasia dragon scale for me, otherwise known as the Alocasia bajinda mythic dragon scale. This alocasia, they just sent to me because they were sending me a bunch of alocasia for me to try out. And I wasn't ready to fall in love with this plant as much as I did. Like I was fully ready to be so obsessed with the alocasia cuprea, but the alocasia dragon scale is so beautiful to look at. And here's why. The variation of green in the dragon scale leaves is so wide. It has the lightest 
green on the inside and then the darkest green veins. It's so beautiful. It looks painted. It looks animated. It doesn't look real. I'm obsessed with it. And then the backside of the leaves are green, but the veins are purple. So to me, the backside of the Alocasia Dragon Scale is as beautiful as the front side of it. Like I'm obsessed. I will say it's been more difficult for me to, I guess, get to know this plant than other plants. I have struggled a little bit with overwatering. It seems a little bit more sensitive than the Alocasia cuprea. Its leaves are a little bit thinner. So I wonder if that's the case. So I'm in the process of figuring out its watering needs, but I'm totally obsessed and I won't give up on it because I think it's just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. So you probably know the Alocasia poly, which is also called the African mask, but that's a, it's a small, like classic kind of Alocasia that you'll see in so many different garden centers. So if you like that look, I would highly recommend the Alocasia longiloba mythic African mask. It's a bigger plant. It's much longer leaves. It's a little bit lighter green than the classic Alocasia poly. And it's so elegant. I feel like this is a very elegant alocasia. It could be a statement plant because it's so tall and the leaves are so pronounced. It's so gorgeous. You could put that as like a centerpiece on a table or something. And then I really love the alocasia Watsoniana white vein. This is, it kind of looks more like your classic alocasia, but it's really big. The leaves are like, I want to say 10 inches long. It's got dark, green, glossy leaves, and then white veins on top of it, uh, and then white veins. And the leaves are super shiny, long stems, beautiful purple backside. Um, It's just stunning. And it is taller in that kind of other, I would say my plant is maybe a foot and a half tall. So it's another one of those statement plants that you could put on its own if you're kind of more of a minimalist plant parent. And I'll say it's doing really well. It's a little hardier than the other alocasia that I found. So I've really liked the alocasia watsoniana white vein. And then last but not least, this is my other new like crazy little plant. (laughs) Crazy little find. I never thought I would own this plant, um, but they sent it to me to try out. And I'm very happy that I have uh, the alocasia stingray, otherwise known as the alocasia mycorrhiza mythic stingray. Plant friends, these leaves look like stingrays. It is wild. It's basically like if you took a normal alocasia leaf with the top lobes that are so beautiful, and then you just kind of like shrink wrapped the bottom, right? So it has that stingray tail. It's so funny looking. It's such a statement plant. It could totally stand on its own. It's in my like renoed closet that I told you about. And it's doing great so far. I am loving it. It's putting out new leaves. I think the stingray tail is so wild. It's so funny to look at. It's a dark green leaf. And also the stingray tail is kind of wavy. So it does, it provides a different texture in the scope of my plant collection, which I really like. This plant is native to the islands of Brunei near the South China Sea, which is known for its dense, rugged rainforest. So I've heard that they're finicky, but so far so good. Like I've been loving this plant and and not seeing a lot of issues with it at all. And once again, I think it would be such an amazing plant. So I think those are all the alocasia that I'm currently caring for. Everybody's doing great. Like I said, the dragon scale is definitely like what I'm needing to kind of develop more of a relationship with, but it's still putting off new leaves. Like it's still doing great. I have that under a grow light. I'm having so much fun with these alocasia. I think they're so fun. They're the colors that they put off, the purple with the green, the variety of green in their leaves, the fact that they're my little alien friends looking at me, cheering me on. I just love them so much. And I'm so happy, you know, if you guys have been OG listeners a long time ago, I mean, two years ago at this point, I was like, I'm entering my alocasia era. And then I kind of failed miserably at it. And I'm really happy I've taken the time to kind of figure it out and apply myself and get the humidity right and get the watering right, because it's really worthwhile. These are such beautiful plants. They they provide such beautiful texture and contrast in my sea of, you know, monstera and ZZ plants and snake plants that I have. And it's really fun. It's been really fun for me to kind of take on a genus and become a student again, as I've been caring for plants now for seven years and have kind of gotten the hang of it. So it's been so fun. I hope you consider trying your alocasias. Let me know which you have. Comment on the social media posts on Instagram of of this alocasia episode and let me know like what alocasia do you already have? What are your care tricks with the alocasia that you have? What are you jonesing for, right? 
And of course, thanks again to our partner, Proven Winners Leaf Joy. If you want to add Alocasia to your collection, you can go to provenwinners.com, figure out where your local Leaf Joy dealer is, and go check it out. Ask your garden center if they carry them. But man, I am so impressed with the quality of the houseplants that Proven Winners Leaf Joy is putting on the market. And I can't wait to just keep adding to my collection this year. I hope you like this episode. It's a solo episode, super focused. We just dove deep. We got nerdy. I hope it was helpful. My inbox is always open to you guys. If you ever want to reach out with a request for an episode, Maria at growingjoywithmaria.com. You can always DM me, growingjoywithmaria on Instagram and TikTok. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. It means so much to me that I get to be part of your planty journey. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. We have so many incredible interviews and solo episodes on incredible houseplant and gardening topics that you will not want to miss this year. And while you're over there in the podcast player subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section of Growing Joy with Plants and leave us a review. Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got so many options for you. First, I highly recommend you taking the plant parent personality test. It's free. It's super fun. It takes three minutes to complete. At the end of the test, you're going to get your plant parent personality profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you and your lifestyle inspired by your results. The links are in the show notes. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, I have so many free downloads on my website that I think could help you, like the Understanding Natural Light download or nine different ways to green up your office space. If you'd like to support the show monetarily and help me bring the show to as many people as possible for free, you can head to our Patreon link in the show notes to learn more about our offerings. And finally, I invite you to come hang out with me and continue the planty conversation on social media, on Instagram and TikTok. I'm growing joy with Maria. My DMs are always open if you have requests for topics or ideas for the show. Thank you again for listening. It is truly my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy.